Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the VCast. My name's Amal Matu from University of Maryland. I'm actually sitting here in my office at University of Maryland on campus in downtown Baltimore. We might even hear a siren whizzing by in a little bit. And on today's VCast, we're going to spend some time talking about bread and butter deadly condition that we all have to know a lot about, and that is hyperkalemia. And to help us get through this particular topic, we have a legendary, an iconic emergency physician named Corey Slovis. Many of you have seen Corey, know Corey, have heard Corey speak before, but for those people who are unfamiliar with the term CME, perhaps you haven't heard or uh, seen Corey Slovis speak before. Corey is an icon in emergency medicine, and he's been around for a long time. Uh, I'm not trying to say he's really old, but he may be. But anyway, he's been talking about this particular topic for many, many years. And I know he hates it when I say that because it makes him feel old, but whatever, it's true. He's a great guy. He's professor and chairman of emergency medicine at Vanderbilt. And uh, he's got a lot of areas of interest, EMS and emergency cardiology, but electrolytes are something that he is also very well known for. And he's incredibly, incredibly smart. How smart, you may ask? Well, I'll put it this way. Ever hear of Plato? Aristotle, Socrates, huh, morons compared to Corey. All right, Seth, I had to get in a little Princess Bride quote for those people that know me. You know that I love the Princess Bride. In fact, over my left shoulder here in the office is uh, a signed poster that some of our graduates gave me a number of years ago. All of the original characters signed that poster. And sitting on top of the poster is Wesley, the man in black. Uh, so anyway, perhaps that's a little bit odd. We're going to try to go through this topic, and uh, for those people, again, that have never experienced the Slovis, here he is. He's uh, really great. Oh, and uh, this was taped at Resuscitation 2012. Great conference. It's in Las Vegas. It was in the spring this past year, and uh, Resuscitation 2013 will be, again, back in Vegas in May. May 1st through the 5th. Check out the website. We'll have some really great speakers coming back. But anyway, on to Dr. Slovis. There are some emergencies that are, you know, they're okay. Cardiac arrest, acute tamponade. I think the reason we went into acute care was for electrolyte emergencies. And so it's a privilege for me to be able to spend the next two and a half hours with you. Uh, don't worry, he's just kidding. Two and a half hours of electrolytes, I'd be dipping into my stash of, of uh, Baileys, which is the other thing I love, But uh, besides the Princess Bride. But anyway, you know, his lecture was only half an hour. We're only covering hyperkalemia in this, but he did talk about the rest of electrolytes as well. Back to Corey. We're going to do electrolyte emergencies. I want to dig really deep into them. So, first one, and without doubt, the most important single electrolyte emergency that we have to be international masters on, that we have to know how to treat better than the nephrologists, is acute hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, without doubt, is the most important, acute, and most lethal acute electrolyte emergency. The most common cause of hyperk is not renal failure. What is the most common cause of hyperk? And it ain't lab error either. The lab can detect difference between 4.1 and 4.2. It's you and me. It's the drawing of the blood. It's the agitation of the blood. It is extra vitro hemolysis. And so because the number one cause of hyper-K is not, when you have hyperkalemia, your first move is EKG. You got a K of 9, you might have it, you might not. You got a sine wave on the EKG. Oh, mama. So please, hyper-K, EKG. As soon as you hear hyper-K, EKG, because that's what's going to guide the therapy. The three main changes, tall, peaked T waves, usually seen around a K of 5.5. Five. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, loss of the P, and then the QRS widening, usually around 8, sometimes a little bit earlier. Be careful in renal failure patients that are non-compliant long-term with their dialysis. Their heart is bathed in a hyper-K bath chronically, and so they may not develop these changes sequentially. And at a K of 7, 7.5, they're looking actually pretty normal. Maybe their T's are a little big, and all of a sudden they just widen out. Be careful. Okay, so let's recap here for just a moment. Number one, the most common cause of hyperkalemia, or the most common cause of an elevated potassium level, I should say, is it's not real. In other words, there's some type of lab mistake 
or maybe it was drawn, there was uh, drawn incorrectly, there's hemolysis. So when you get an elevated potassium level back, don't panic on it unless the patient also looks sick. First thing you do, get a 12 lead EKG and then correlate the EKG with the potassium level. If the EKG looks like true hyperkalemia, then run with it, treat it. But sometimes that potassium level is elevated, the EKG looks completely normal. If it doesn't make sense, closely monitor the patient and repeat the potassium level keeping an eye on that 12 lead EKG. So Corey's second point goes along with the first point. The EKG should guide therapy. And if your EKG doesn't look concerning, you might need to reconsider whether that truly is hyperkalemia. Next core point to be an electrolyte expert is we need to know when to give calcium. Calcium used to be a major ACLS drug. It's rarely used. But you want to know when do you give calcium. And the indication for calcium is wide QRS. If you have tall peak T waves, calcium doesn't do anything. If you have a prolonged PR interval, calcium don't do anything. If you have a widened QRS, calcium narrows the QRS. And a hyperkalemic emergency is defined as a wide QRS. Calcium, wide QRS, it tricks the cell. It doesn't affect the serum potassium level. Um, I do think it's important to know some physical chemistry. This is an EM photomicrograph blown up for you. You can see calcium and chloride. This is the Lewis acid structure. See how small chloride is? Look how big gluconate is. You know gluconate is going to be a bigger molecule. See how much bigger that word is? To fit it inside there. And if you look closely, it is three times as large. If you had a bottle, because the gluconate is three times as large, there is one-third the amount of calcium in calcium gluconate is calcium chloride. So for an emergency, calcium chloride. Three times the amount of free calcium. For hypocalcemia, for slow infusions of calcium, or calcium given to us in a small vein, calcium gluconate. But for hyper-K, calcium chloride, you bring out the big guns. It's sclerosing, it's potent. Only give calcium if a wide QRS. Now, bicarbonate is something else. And when you give bicarbonate, you're trading it out. You're trying to pull hydrogen out of the cell to trade potassium back in. Bicarbonate is outstanding in hyper-K. Bicarbonate is outstanding. You give this negative, the hydrogen comes out of the cell, potassium goes in. But bicarbonate only if acidotic. If your patient is not acidotic, if they have hyper-K from an ACE inhibitor, they have hyper-K from a non-renal failure, non-acidotic cause. Bicarbonate, not effective. Only if acidotic. And here you can see bicarbonate given to patients who are non-acidotic. It has no effect. Uh, epinephrine, a beta agonist, works well. Glucose and insulin works great. And hemodialysis, the best. So to, to close on hyper-K, let's treat it. There, are, there ought to be five, but there are three steps. Step one, if the QRS is wide, reverse it. Calcium, wide QRS. Drive it into the cell. The single best way, glucose and insulin, 5 to 1 ratio, 2 amps of uh, D50, 100 grams of uh, glucose, 5 to 1, 10 units IV push insulin. Put on a beta mask. It stimulates the sodium-potassium pump, just a, a, a continuous albuterol inhalation. Give them 100 or 200 cc's to rev the pump and bicarbonate only if acidotic. You've got a renal failure patient, a, a pH of 7-0, a couple amps of bicarb, spectacular. And then to get it out of the body, if they can make urine, like with rhabdo or dehydration, let them pee it out. But most patients have gotten hyper because they can't excrete it. Dialysis is the way to go. All right. So I, I guess I've kind of been screwing that up. So the first point he made was that calcium is really the marker of significant hyperkalemia. The widening of the QRS is the main concern that tells you that this patient is heading for an arrhythmia. So calcium is primarily to be used when the QRS is wide, and it's probably not necessary when all you've got is just peaking of the T waves. So I guess I've been using calcium haphazardly. Uh, and then the second point he made is that bicarbs only effective if the patient is acidotic. If they're not acidotic, then bicarb's not doing anything. And third point that he made is go ahead and give him some beta agonists. It's, it's not actually going to lower the potassium that much or significantly, but use a lot of albuterol or whatever beta agonist, and that might be helpful as well. So calcium if the QRS is wide, bicarb if they're acidotic, and then the beta agonists. And then the, the key other player 
that you should get started early, of course, is the insulin. And he made a nice point, give two amps of D50 so that you avoid that hypoglycemia uh, later on. So, all right, good teaching points. Dialysis, of course, um, he hasn't mentioned KX late yet, so let's see what he has to say about the KX late. Do a lot of you, I, I, you don't have to raise your hands, but raise them in your brain. Do a lot of you use Kaoxalate because it's so good? If I wasn't in a big room, I'd say Kaoxalate sucks. Don't use it. Wait, what did he just say? Kaoxalate sucks. Don't use it. Kaoxalate sucks. Don't use it. I thought this was the drug that we're supposed to use in the emergency department to get rid of the potassium until the dialysis people arrive. Kaoxalate is not as effective as you think, and it doesn't work acutely. It takes about 12 hours to really work, and please be aware of the following. Colonic necrosis was 70% sorbitol. Colonic necrosis, enemas, concentrated sorbitol. Don't use it. Oral, 35%. Colonic enemas, I mean, I don't want to make a value judgment. We're in Vegas, but for hyper-K, no. I think that you have to, when you give a hyper-K talk, you've got to show a couple EKGs, wide QRS, tall, pointed T waves. Uh, here's a narrow QRS, really narrow, pointed, peaked T waves. Let me close by saying five things on hyper-K. Number one, calcium, only if a wide QRS. Bicarbonate, only if acidotic. Glucose and insulin, outstanding. But be aware, insulin takes glucose into the cell, it takes potassium into the cell. Follow their glucoses. Beware of hypoglycemia uh, an hour later. Beta agonist, start it, love it. Volume, just a little. Now, Corey's going to drive me to drink with this myth busting he's doing. So, calcium only if there's a wide QRS, bicarb only if they're acidotic, and I'll beat her all sure, go ahead and give it insulin. Great, I've been doing that, but give two amps of D50. And uh, what else? Uh, get the dialysis people on board. All right, fine. And um, k -exalate. hmm, not so good. I've been using it for 16 years, 19 years, including residency. How about that? Doesn't work. Inconceivable. Inconceivable. It has been a privilege. This is a great conference. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, my thanks to Dr. Corey Slovis. And all jokes aside, he's an incredibly smart guy and just a fantastic person. And it was a real honor to have him join us at Resuscitation 2012. Hopefully, he'll be back again in coming years. Uh, but in 2013, we've got a, an assortment of other great speakers. So check it out on the website. And if you want the entire Corey Slovis electrolyte lectures, you can get that half an hour. Uh, you can get that off CME download. So we'll be back with another VCast in the coming weeks. And until then, take care, everyone.